Hi, and welcome to another edition of Connecting the Dots, Bible Difficulties. I'm here with Moses. Thanks for inviting me. Welcome to another episode of our weekly retreat in the Bible. We're going through the New Testament. We're into Matthew chapter 17 today. Please take some time, like and share as you please, and say a prayer. Invite the Holy Spirit to enlighten your minds and your hearts, your souls, on what God would have for you today. As always, we're focusing in on any difficulties people may have. We're not necessarily explaining everything in the Bible. We're talking about every verse. So feel free to share with those who may have some difficulties with the Bible, and hopefully they may receive some connections that they did not have before, or did not notice before. As always, we welcome you. Thanks for being with us. Matthew chapter 17, the transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. A voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. They did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Jesus heals a demon-possessed boy. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus predicts his death a second time. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. The temple tax. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked. From whom? Do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes, from their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. We invite you to take a few moments and meditate on what you just heard and read. We'll be back in a moment. All right, welcome back. Moses, any difficulties you want to talk about? So, yeah, I would like to start actually with the last verse of the previous chapter. As we were discussing last week, this verse truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Of course, if this is a different chapter, it could be thought that we were talking about this difficulty the other day. But here is a confirmation that actually 
some of the people who were there at that moment when Jesus said that, they actually saw the Son of Man with his power and glory. And that's how actually, that's the, what we call the, the transfiguration, is how we call it. Yes. So it's not something that it's about to happen in the years ahead, but it's something that actually happened very close to that moment. Absolutely. Uh, actually, yeah. what I wanted to come on as well, of course, because it's the very next verse. These chapters and verses were not put in for 16 centuries later. So you don't always see that it's the next verse because you're in a different chapter, but it's the very next verse. He takes them up the mountain and shows them his glory. So yeah, absolutely. It's very profound. Yeah, that's one thing there. And the other one that I would like to point out is the fact that previously John the Baptist had denied being Elijah and being the prophet. Here we see that actually the confirmation from Jesus saying that, yes, he was Elijah. So there are a number of things that can be said about this. So I'll just start with one of them, which is the fact that if the disciples that were with Jesus during the transfiguration actually saw Elijah and Moses. So if they actually saw Elijah there, then this tears apart the one understanding or one interpretation of some people that say that John the Baptist was the reincarnation of Elijah, which is something that I I've never seen in the Bible that teaching, but I've seen some people that are that have discussed about that possibility, which I consider to be completely nonsense because then the disciples have recognized John the Baptist and Elijah during the transfiguration of Jesus as the same person, which doesn't seem to have happened. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that the, that the prophecy even when it says that Elijah will come to announce the coming of the Messiah, we have to also understand the way that that prophecy, it's being expressed because it says that it will come with his power. And if we see the teachings from John the Baptist and we read a little bit about the story of Elijah, we see that there are a lot of things in common, the way that they were actually preaching. So they were very similar in the way that they were preaching the news. So to me, that's actually a very clear reference to what Elijah coming to announce the Messiah mean. All right, good points. And I think it's one of the most important things of what we're trying to do here is to pull some of those things out and try to make connections. So I would have to say from the first part of your statement that there is a lot going on here that isn't easy to connect. And it's probably one of the most important things to talk about in this chapter is, number one, that John the Baptist said that he's not Elijah. All right. So he's not the reincarnation of Elijah. But there's a number of things here. Number one, at this point, John the Baptist has already passed. So even if he's Elijah and he shows up on the mountain, well, he's already passed. Second thing is, Elijah never passed in the first place. He's one of those that was taken up into heaven. He didn't die. His spirit was taken up into heaven without dying. So it's not technically a reincarnation anyway. That's second thing. Third thing is that whether he actually had the spirit of Elijah, meaning God throughout scriptures has had divine exceptions for his purposes, the Virgin Mary is clearly one of them. He decided how Jesus would be born that he would be born of a woman, but by the Spirit of God, as the Father is fathering Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And so that was clearly a divine exception. As Catholics, we believe that Mary intercedes for us and that she was also born without sin, not because of anything she did or any choices, really, that she made, but by divine exception, and that Jesus pre-redeemed her and that therefore she would be a perfect vessel to bring Jesus into the world and that no corruption would touch Jesus even in his birth. So there are a lot of those kinds of divine exceptions going on in scripture that we have to balance with the things that are more obvious or the things that we can talk about. So this is one of those that is very difficult because John the Baptist said, I'm not Elijah, but John the Baptist was a human being. He was also without complete knowledge. And Jesus is clearly saying he is the Elijah that was to come. He is the one that was to announce Jesus. Defining how to put that connection together 
that I'm not going to attempt to do. I'm simply going to say that there, there are clearly things going on here that need more consideration, need more meditation, and that even in the catechism, for example, the Catholic Church, they do define John the Baptist as Elijah, but they never say anything about a reincarnation. We don't believe, as Christians, we don't believe in reincarnation, but Elijah had exceptions that normal people do not have. And so God had leeway there, I think, to use his spirit in a way that we don't quite understand at this point. But to me, the real connection there is to know that John the Baptist was that spirit spoken about in the Old Testament. He was the Elijah to come that would prepare the way for the Lord. And that, to me, is the most important part of that. So any counter thoughts you have on that? One thing that I would mention just is the fact that Elijah, in fact, he didn't die, as you had mentioned. And there is a belief from Jews, and they still believe it, that Moses never tasted death because Moses' tomb was never found in a mountain where he supposed to have died. And just to mention that the fact that if he was also taken as Elijah, then there's a, a kind of connection here that those two characters were the one here that were appearing during this moment couple of things yeah. there, and again, great points. Number one, Scripture clearly says that Moses passed. So it doesn't matter what the Jews believe. <laughs> scripture clearly says that he passed away just before Joshua took people into the Promised Land. So that's okay. one thing to point out. The other is that what is interesting to me, and this is a favorite topic in Christian circles that study the Bible, is who the two end witnesses will be. In my opinion, there's only three options. There's only three people that tradition says did not die, and that scripture doesn't clearly say they died. And those are, do you know who the three are? Elijah is the first one. I would say, I don't know, Mary? Actually, Enoch was the first one. Oh, Enoch. Enoch, right. Elijah, and Mary. And Mary. Exactly. Yes. So isn't that interesting? And there's lots and lots of connections there that, of course, people who have their own theories will counteract, and that's what we want. We want those commentaries. That's fine, as long as you do it in a loving Christian manner. But when you notice that, what you notice is that Elijah has passed. Because if John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah, now he's passed. So every man shall die once. And scripture says that in the end, the two witnesses will die. Who will the two witnesses be? Do they have any connection to those that haven't died before? Who knows? But it seems likely. And it seems likely that those two would be Enoch and Mary, which, of course, is a completely different theory than I've ever heard in those Christian circles. They all have their own theories, and they spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. I'm not going to spend any time figuring that out, but those are two interesting things I like to point out when thinking about that topic. Moving on, a couple of things I want to point out here is Peter's excitement. He says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. And you can just imagine that would be our excitement. <laughs> the first question is, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? Is that just divine revelation that's put into scripture? It seems that Peter was well aware of who they were. And by the way, the reason for Moses and Elijah often pointed out is because Moses had to do with the law and Elijah had to do with the prophets. So it was about the law and the prophets of the Old Testament that was coming into fulfillment with Jesus and coming into a new age with the transfiguration. I didn't know that. Yeah, so that's huge because Elijah, of course, being the main prophet and the one that was to announce the prophet, the final, the prophet of prophets, the Lord Jesus Christ. As you will see many times mentioned both in scripture and in mass and in various ways, it's all built on the law and the prophets. Everything that Jesus was to fulfill, fulfilling the law and the prophets. So that makes a whole lot of sense then once you see that as to why Moses and Elijah were there. So that's one thing I just like to point out. The other is how Peter immediately then wants to control. He wants to keep the spirit there. And it's a very natural thing. I'm not uh, saying anything against him for that, but he immediately wants to say, let's keep them here. Let's build some tents and make sure they stay around for a while because this is really exciting. And I just love that enthusiasm that Peter has as well. He's our model for both good and bad in, in that sometimes he's so emotional that he's working against the plans of God 
but he does it for all the right reasons. He's just very excited. And I think it's a little taste of what heaven actually looks like or feels like. Yeah, absolutely. So then that leads us into six. Why does God veil his glory in the first place? And verse six kind of gives us a response to that. If we saw the glory of God in our finite beings, and there are places in scripture where people suggest that you would die if you saw God face to face. Die of fear is really what it is. And it's not fear like we think of fear. It's overwhelming glory. It's that overwhelming spirituality that our bodies just can't handle. And so he veils a good portion of who he is for our benefit in these finite bodies. And that all through scripture, where even in Moses' day, once God even came and reflected off of Moses, they were freaking out. They were too afraid. And they said, veil yourself because it's just too much for us. So that's one thing. But the other thing I think important to point out here is free will. The whole point of all this is God wanting to share what he had. God is perfect. He doesn't need anything. He's not for want of anything. And yet he is love. And if you are love, what do you do with it? If you have love, for example, in your heart, what do you do with that? Well, you share it with others. Otherwise, it's not really uh, useful. So God, being love, creates these free will beings to share in what he has. But he can't do that if they're just robots, if they're just made to perform tasks a certain way without that free will. And as I always say, if you saw a drop of God's glory, you would be so overwhelmed that you would follow him anywhere. You would do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. You would be that overwhelmed. And so God, in his mercy, veils himself. Most of our lives, we don't capture the purity of his glory. We only capture glimpses of his glory. And he does that for our benefit. So that we can have free will to have little faith or have great faith to move mountains. And for me, that is another gift of God that he veils himself. What you're saying makes complete sense to me. Then right after that, he complains about their little faith. In verse 17, he, he calls them an unbelieving and perverse generation. Now, as we see those words in English, that's pretty strong language. And really, I think he's just showing his human frustration. How long shall I put up with you? How long shall I be with you? And I think the answer to that is forever. He will be with us always. But he's showing his frustration here in that they're not capturing it yet. And to me, I like that. I like the fact that he's trying to point them in a new direction, whereas up to now, we have been so enslaved by the enemy's distortion. Our faith has been so blocked by the enemy's distortion of the message of the ally. Our God, who created us, is always sending us messages. But the enemy is always distorting that message. And so, for me, he's pointing that out, saying perverse more in the way, not so much how we think of perverse as someone who is, say, sexually perverted, but perverse as in not aligned not aligned with the messages that God is providing us. And to me, that's what he's pointing out here. So then he comes to the point where, as I suggested, if we could capture the real message and we could begin to believe that we could move mountains, and sometimes that moving mountains doesn't necessarily have to be a physical mountain. I certainly believe, absolutely believe, that if we had the kind of faith he's referring to, the kind of purity of faith he's referring to, that we in fact could move physical mountains as well as all the mountains of problems in our lives, the mountains of debt or the mountains of fear, the mountains of the unknown. We could move those mountains if we truly trusted in his message and just kept that close to our hearts rather than, say, looking at all of the other things that the enemy sends us to block that message. All right, then moving on to verse 24, Jesus is talking about who should pay for the taxes, the duty and the taxes. Should the children pay for it? So him being a child of the king of everything, him being the only real son of God, 
the rest are adopted. So we're all adopted into that family. And so he's suggesting that the children of the kingdom should not have to pay those things and should be focused more on the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdoms of earth. But also showing that he has full power to do whatever he would need to do. And so he is setting this up to show that he is giving himself for the world. They're not taking anything from him. There's nothing they could do. They could tax him beyond measure. They could try to take his life, which they tried to do several times before his appointed hour. And they had no ability to control him. And he's showing that here once again with this miracle that we think is pretty out of ordinary, where he's using his power to pay taxes. But he's showing that those taxes aren't really just for him anyway. So this is just like a side note. That he's both showing his power to give his life for us rather than have it taken from him. And to me, I think that's a powerful lesson as well. And with that, I'll say thanks again for joining us for another week. Hopefully you got something out of this, and we always appreciate your likes and shares. Those obviously help, and feel free to share this with anyone that you think this may be of help to them. It certainly would be helpful if you can share that with them, and hopefully they can find something of value in it and make some connections in their lives, which brings them more peace and more joy and more love for everyone. With that, we bid you adieu. Moses, I think, lost connection there toward the end. So with that, have another wonderful week, and we say God bless you. Bye-bye.